find a process that takes your people an absorbent amount of time to do a very simple task, a very repeatable task. That's where you're going to crush your ROI. A quick interruption to mind you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari Santiago, President CEO of IT Direct. Welcome to another exciting episode of Made in America. Today, I've got CJ Bina from Robotic Advantage. I am so excited to hear about the advancements in robotics and the impact it's having on Connecticut manufacturing. CJ, thank you so much for coming out today. Thanks for having me. Well, listen, man, it's the Made in America podcast. So we start off with the same two questions. What do you make? And why do you make it? We make robotic automation cells. Not necessarily all of them have robotic arms, like everybody likes to think, <laughs> but we just automate processes that help companies uh, become more efficient, more streamlined, and increase their productivity. Nice. And well, why do we make it? Yeah, because yeah. in today's market, and a lot of the reshoring and stuff, now that's happening, but even previously, in order to improve your process, maybe make a better part, or make it more efficiently or price competitive, being able to implement some automation gets you to that end goal. Yeah, listen, I'm a big fan of technology. Uh, I think technology, automation, robotics, I4.0, it's certainly the wave of the future. So I'm really excited to have you on and like kind of get into a little bit of the weeds on that. And yeah. I really think our audience is going to get a lot from it. I think it's so important that the leading manufacturers in Connecticut lean into technology uh, so they can continue to lead in the future. But before we get into that, let's get a little personal, man. Yeah. Uh, why are you into it, CJ? What What's the story that got you into manufacturing, into robotics in specific? So manufacturing, uh, I got into it because my father ran a shop out of our garage. So <laughs> straight out of diapers, I was in my high chair <laughs> while he was running the machine and I sat there and watched. Nice. And then I got out of diapers and he said, hey, take those parts over there and go put them in that part washer. <laughs> and I did that. And then I got to maybe seven years old and the statute of limitations is now over. So <laughs> I was running a saw and <laughs> it was completely not safe knowing how my kids are now. And it's asking them to go run a saw, but we did it. I still have all my fingers. That's right. Um, and then, you know, I, he totally explains why you think someone could use robots, but continue <laughs> yes, on. Yes, yes, yes. So, and, and then, uh, you know, he closed the shop down. He went to work at some other places. I went to school, um, went to school for computer engineering. And when I came out, I just started applying to anywhere that said something about programming, not necessarily that it was a programming language I knew, it said programming. I said, yeah, I could probably manage that. So I went and worked for a company that automated food processing, food and beverage processing plants. Um, and I knew nothing about what they were doing. Learned it all, learned it all on the job. I had a boss who was a little rough around the edges because he was a seasoned veteran and he had this new kid who knew nothing. <laughs> and so it, it was trying at times between the two of us, but I learned more than I ever learned in school from that individual. And then from there, I went to work for a couple of distributors. And now um, I actually work with my father. He's he's uh, one of the guys at the shop now. And, uh, and we, we're in the manufacturing space together and working on uh, these robotic systems together. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so, I, full what's circle. It, I was going to ask you about that, man. Well, first of all, does he treat you differently than when you were seven? No. No. All right. That's no, it. I am <laughs> still his son. Uh, now that he's seen, you know, the the technology and, and the the cells we're able to do and how much goes into them, and and he's really fascinated by technology. Always has been. Um, I got I got a little more respect out of him. He's nice. like, wow, you know, that's pretty cool that you know how to do that. But he has no problem coming to my office and you know putting a foot up my rear end if he had to. <laughs> um, you know, it, in the, it, it's still professional. Like I call him by his first name at the office. And then as soon as he leaves the office and he calls my phone, I'm like, what's up, dad? <laughs> He's like, okay. I'm like, well, we, we got to have a little separation here. Yeah, so, but, separation uh, of church and state. Exactly, 100%. Yeah. So it's, uh, it, it's awesome to be able to still have that with him. You know, we, we've always kind of shared that passion for manufacturing. Um, you know, his father owned the shop that he took over and then moved into our garage. So it's definitely in my blood to be in manufacturing. I'm just kind of nestled up next to it now instead of being right down the, the pipeline. Yeah, or maybe taking it to the next level, right? Where right. It's, uh, taking it into the future. So what's it like working with your dad? Is it cool? Like, what's It's the, fun. Yeah. It is. Um, I mean, you have some, You always have something to talk about. Not that you don't with your father, but, you know, I'm, I see him two or three times a week. Not every kid gets to see his dad that often. Mm -hmm. um, we've always been really close, so so it's been it's been great that way. Um, and 
you just, you, you always have somebody you can walk into his office. I can shut his, shut the door. But can you believe this just happened? Like what the, and throw anything out at him. He'd be like, all right, you feel better now? Okay, let's go. Get back to That's it. it. That's it. Get back it out cool? there and figure it out. You know, you guys kind of are in the same field. Yeah. And I just wonder, is it fun to kind of have a same, a similar passion to that your dad has? So it's not just a father son relationship, you know, even a good father son relationship, which can be great and right. blessed. I'm blessed to have one of those, but then to have an even deeper level of like a passion for the same type of work, the same type of stuff every day, does it help take the relationship to another level? And is it kind of extra rewarding? It, it does. Yeah. Cause you know, Let's say I was, I don't know, let's come up with some, I was a doctor, right? Mm -hmm. And I could call him up and be like, dad, I just did this awesome procedure. I stitched this guy up. I did whatever. He'd be like, oh, I don't really know what you're talking about, but that sounds great. <laughs> like, congratulations. Now I can be like, hey, dad, come look in the back. Like, this happens. And he knows exactly what he, I'm talking about. And he, not that he wouldn't be just as happy for what I did if I was say, a doctor, but there's this whole level of like, I know what it took to get to that mm -hmm. point. And like, it's pretty cool that you got there. Yeah. And also one totally understands the outcome, right? Cause right. you're in the business of automating that business and for your dad to have seen his father and now see you and how far it's come and have, having to see his son kind of take it to the next level. That's just gotta be such a source of pride for him. I can imagine. I actually haven't had the conversation with him. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. He's been like, oh, I'm proud of you. Like, sure, you know, of course, comes of up. But I haven't been like, hey, how cool is it to know like where your father stood and now where I'm standing and to see that whole, you know, his dad was running manual lathes or manual mills, bridge ports. Mm -hmm. and then he got into the CNC stuff. And now I'm putting robots that are communicating with his CNC machines and, and loading and unloading and inspecting and putting offsets automatically into a CNC machine. I mean, he, he's like, you know, to see where it was, to see where now where it's going. He's like, you never would have thought in a million years when we were running stuff in the garage that now... I'm sitting there showing him things on machines and he's like, uh, okay. okay. And then it works. And he's like, well, apparently you know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Some big shoes for your son to fill. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, hopefully, and I don't see it, not hopefully, it's not going to go anywhere. Automation is here to stay. Whether you want to jump on board mm. or you want to try and push it off, it's not going anywhere. It's the only way you're going to be able to compete come that, you know, in the future. So if I would hope they're not hope if he wants to do something else then great i'll support him but if he wants to get in it it's going to be a career that's going to work for him yeah and not that everything is about making money and, and but i have a great passion for it i take a whole lot of pride i enjoy it and if he can get that same thing out of doing what i do then great if yeah. not then hopefully he finds it whatever he wants to do so it is really interesting that you took a path kind of through computer science and programming to get into manufacturing and uh, you know we will get to the automation details but but i just talk a little bit about that because it's something that um, I've been talking about for a while and I'm hearing it, you know, sometimes you feel like you're yelling into a room and no one's hearing anything. And not that I've started this by any means, but now all of a sudden I hear other people talking about, oh, there's a big demand for programmers in manufacturing and the demand's getting bigger. And, you know, pretty soon, uh, you know, manufacturers here in Connecticut are going to be competing with the insurance companies and the finance companies and the software development companies mm -hmm. for this like computer programming talent. So just, I'm curious, you know, talk about your journey a little bit through computer programming into manufacturing and how many other people from your class even followed that path? I know of, so my path, I went to UMass Dartmouth, mm -hmm. uh, computer engineering there, and always thought that, and I took a couple of programming classes in high school, always thought I just wanted to sit behind my computer, write code that you would, would work a program on your computer. That's what I thought. You thought you'd be do. writing apps. I thought I'd be writing apps. I'd be doing websites or whatever. Or, you know, some software on your computer. You double click on that icon and my stuff pops up. Um, and then went through college. Still thought that's, you know, did computer engineering. Still thought that's what I was going to be doing. And then uh, after I went away to military school for a year, came back and started applying to, to jobs. Like I said, just applied to anything that said programming because I thought programming is programming. <laughs> Little did I know there's this thing called PLC programming <laughs> that uh, controls things versus just puts them on a screen. And this company said, you know, we'd, we'd love to have you. Come on in. And... Little did I know I would be in automation. Did you know, I mean, obviously you knew at the job, but yeah. were you were you, were you trepidatious going into this job to do PLC programming when you thought you were going to be doing like C Sharp or whatever and and writing apps? Like, like, give me your mindset. You saw this opportunity. What were you thinking? 
it was an opportunity. And at the time that I was coming on the job market, there wasn't that much. Um, they offered me what I thought was a good salary and it was a job <laughs> and, uh, I took it and within weeks, month, maybe first two months, I knew I was going to end up staying in that field. I had a great passion for it and I was a 21 year old kid and the company I worked for, most of my work was on site. So we would be, I'd be in my office for two or three months doing some design work, programming work. And then I'd be in, I lived in New Orleans for nine months. I was a mile and a quarter from Bourbon Street at 21 years <laughs> old. Like, this is, gets pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Or then I was in Pennsylvania. I did a, a Boston beer plant. I was up in Wisconsin making craisins for ocean spray. Or I got to just travel. It was fun. And the work was rewarding. You know, like we'd go in and at the end of the day, I could walk to the end of the craisin line, put my hand underneath and there's these warm craisins coming out and I'm eating them. <laughs> I 100% had all of, like, you know, I didn't install the equipment. I didn't wire it. But I made it run. And yeah. that was cool. I've always loved like Legos or tinkering with things that, you know, to, to see an outcome. Mm -hmm. It's different than some fields of work where you do a whole bunch of work and it goes to some other place down the line and you never know what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. Doing what we do, you start it. And at the end, you watch it make something or you watch it do something. It's, it's incredibly rewarding. Yeah, dude, that sounds awesome. And was it a mental, I mean, for people that are out there who maybe they're in, they're in software development or, or know someone that is, was it a major shift to give up the app thing? Like, like in your mind, was it? No, I, it really was. It, it wasn't. And it, I, now that you said, I've never thought of it until you honestly just, you, know, you just proposed like that. And as soon as I got in, it was like, all right, well, this is the job. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, we start again and it's my first job. So you learn, you, you win some, you lose some. And as I got into it, really, really enjoyed that making things move or making a light come on. Yeah. Any of the stuff, it, it was very rewarding. And not to say that I wouldn't have if I had designed apps and I very well could have gotten into that and been had the same conversation about designing apps. But I, I I just really got it. took a liking to it and then I never turned back. And I, I you know, something I just, this is just pull out a quick takeaway because I just really love what you just talked about because I think, especially for young people that are listening or people that know young people, I think too often we're, so, we have this pressure in our own mind. Like I went to school to do this. My plan was to do the apps. Here's this other opportunity, but it's not the exact thing I thought. So I got to go to the other thing. And just, I love your attitude of like, hey, this opportunity presented itself. It was sort of tangentially related. And you know what? I'm 21 years old. What is the worst thing that can happen? I'm going to get a new job in two months. Right. And I'll have, and you know what? I'll take along with me knowing that I didn't like that. Right. And the upside is a lifetime of happiness. Yeah. I I am very happy at what within, I go home and I feel rewarded by, you know, I, I was able, or like, even if, even if it's not building something, it's designing something, like I figured out a way mechanically to have some, make something happen that yesterday when I went to bed, I didn't think I could do or, or anything like that. It, it's not so much the financial rewards or anything like that. Sometimes like just having pride in what we're doing and being able to give customers, um, you know, the systems that they've been asking for is it's awesome. So let's talk about the rest of the journey. So you're working for this other company. You're doing, you know, PLC programming. How do we get from that to uh, Robotic Advantage? So I was there for two and a half years and it was great. And then I went to my boss and I said, hey, I'm still kind of shoehorned in this entry level position. I'm doing work that's no longer entry level. Like, can we do something about that? He was like, well, that position was really only ever going to be or like, you know, you're really only ever going to be in that entry level position. And I said, Okay. So <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't remember how I came across my next job. It was actually working for a distributor of, uh, automation equipment or automation hardware and did a bunch of work for them because they were starting up their own engineered, what they call EPG engineering products group. So they would, the salesman would sell all the parts. It would get pushed to our group. We'd build it into a system and then deliver it. Um, after like two years, you, the salesman had zero desire to sell the system. They just wanted to sell their components and get their commission. <laughs> and uh, we agreed to part, you know, we just, I said, it's, it's, it's time for me to go. Yeah. 
Um, and the distributor really liked me, liked that I, you know, I like their products and stuff. So they actually found me my next job <laughs> at another one of their distributors who did bigger systems. Um, and I was there for two, three years. And then uh, the owner of uh, Robotic Advantage, so the, this, this is the mother company, um, they were getting into the, the automation stuff because they're CNC machines and people were asking for automation. And my father worked there and he said, hey, if you're looking to have something done, like my son does this. So the owner brought me in and I worked on the side. I would go, I'd work my f- nine to five up the street. I'd work there from five to seven, five to eight o'clock. And then I'd go home. And that worked for six months. And then he finally was like, hey, I want to bring you on full time and I want to start up an automation business. I said, well, if we can make it work, like I'm in, like, eh, let's start it. I always, I <laughs> had already thought thing. about trying to do it on my own at one point anyways. I was like, you got the money. I got the brains. Let's make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> and and sh- then Robotic Advantage was born. And ever since we have had awesome success and you know they the 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 mother you know whatever our umbrella company however you want to call it they had a wide base in manufacturing that's what they did they they sold the cnc equipment so we already had the customer base it's not like we had to go and start this company fresh and say hey look at us we do this stuff like maybe you can come work with us it was like hey we've sold you i don't know how many machines you've always asked about like how can we make this better well Let's just put this all together in one place and, and we'll get you a complete solution from making the part to inspecting the part to packaging the part. It, it makes it very symbiotic. Yeah. So let's talk about kind of getting into a little bit. So we've got some manufacturing leaders like listening to the podcast. Who can benefit from robotics and automation? Anybody. There, there isn't a, a field, not even in manufacturing. I mean... I'm sure you've seen it in software. There's there's AI and all that stuff. But as far you know, in manufacturing, it's it's anybody. It's it can be as simple as um, you know every fifth part that comes off a CNC machine, somebody's going to mic up, make sure it's in spec. If it's not, they're going to put a an offset in the tool. Well, what if I said that we could put this little system at the end of your machine, and every part it's going to inspect a hundred percent. And it's going to give you that same feedback. So the four parts in between when he last inspected it until now aren't bad parts. They're all within spec. And that's a small investment with a big return. There's yeah. You're not going to have to quote at 80% efficiency. You can quote at 100% efficiency. And not only can you quote at 100% efficiency, you can say to your end customer, I guarantee you 100% of the parts we're making for you are inspected and they're intolerance. That's a big sales pitch. Yeah, it is. How many companies can say to their end vendor, a hundred percent of your parts are now inspected? Uh, that's a pretty. Uh, that's, right. I'm so, I mean, that's yeah. just one. That's just inspection. You will, you can look at uh, something as simple as loading, loading a machine. So the part finishes. If the operator isn't standing right next to the machine when the part's done, it waits for the operator to come over, open the door, open the vise, take out the finished part, blow out the vise, put in the new part, close the vise. <laughs> Close the door and hit the run button. Well, what if right after, right as soon as that tool's done spinning, that door opens, the robot goes in, blows the part off, takes the part, the vice opens automatically, it flips, puts a part in, closes the vice, door closes, and the machine starts. So in and you did nothing. Like you, nobody had to be there. So you're getting a hundred, you know, hundred percent throughput because you have the time for loading. Sure. But the machine is never not operating. Versus if you have one operator has to load even two machines. You can't load them both at the same time. And a robot can't load them both at the same time either. But if you time your cycles right, yeah, then you, you don't can. have to. Sure, you start sure, one, sure. you wait a minute, and then you push start on the other one. Yeah, and then you're going to get them at the and same it's time. Not. So, and, and what that does for your labor force is it allows you to grow. It doesn't, allow you to, it doesn't allow you to shrink your labor force. It allows you to grow. Because now, instead of needing one operator to manage one machine, you can have one operator manage three machines or one operator manage four machines. And what does that do? Well, now you're getting more parts out the door. You're making more money. You can take on additional jobs. You could add more spindles to your shop. And then you're only adding one operator for another four machines you just put in with a robot. And, you know, if you really want to get the bottom line, you pay for the robot once. Right. You don't have to pay the health insurance on a robot. You don't have to worry about getting sick. You can run. You can run your average two shifts just like you normally are now. 
load it up at the end of the day, let the robot run lights out, and you come in in the morning, you got a bucket full of parts. So if I'm looking at my shop and I'm saying, you know, like, CJ, this makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Where do I start, man? Like, I'm looking, I, you know, I get it. Like, conceptually, it makes a lot of sense, but it's just a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm running the business. I'm trying to get throughput. I'm focused on the bottom line. You know, I'm dealing with COVID. I'm trying to deal with, you know, all the challenges of the business. I, I don't even know where to start. Start small. It doesn't have to be a full assembly line. Start with, uh, you know, we can get, you can get you into a gauging system where you can still hand mic stuff. And when you hit the button to measure it, we have a computer that'll talk to your CNC machine. It, it knows what you just measured with that caliper and it's going to put the offset in for you. You could start there. That's a $10,000 $10, is expensive is on the high end of that. And that's a couple mics. That's a small investment to, to make there. You want to talk about just loading and unloading a machine. You can do that very cheap. You can do that for, you know, maybe $100,000, which it sounds scary. Don't get me wrong. But look at it as a five-year investment. You just put $20,000 in a year. You're not going to find labor for $20,000 a year to do that, not with overhead and everything else. And not that, again, the knots is all about labor, but you can take your current workforce, and I guarantee you they have a talent you didn't know they had. <laughs> I guarantee you they have talent you didn't know they had. You can take that guy who you thought could just put a part in and take it out, and you might, he might have some talent where he can go inspect parts for you, or he might be way better at you know, IT. Maybe you needed a new, he has some way to make your computer system run so much better than it is. Yeah, we did a uh, system for a customer and it it took a whole lot of the environmental and uh, uh, abrasion hazard. He was sanding parts manually. So you know, he'd push the part against the face or the face of the part against the belt sander. He'd put it in a thing and they'd engrave the uh, the company logo in it. Well, none of there was no dust collection. There was no guarding. You know, if he slipped, his finger's going in that belt sander. We put this system together. That's not, for that's not a good day. No, yeah, that costed them the company a lot of money. <laughs> and it's a guy sitting there just doing this. We sure. put a system together, and they would just load these blanks in a, ro uh, a little robot, not even like a one scary one that everybody thinks is going to take over the world. Just a little three axis thing that we call a robot, but somebody might just think it's like a little mover. Um, it picked the parts up push them against the belt sander and then had the logo engraved and all of that dust was being collected in a HEPA filter it's all being taken away and that guy actually because now he had so much free time because all he was doing loading trays in and taking full trays out he actually got cross-trained into a new position and got a raise so by bringing in a robot they actually improved their workforce yeah win 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 yeah it's tough to and you're going to get better throughput better right. reliability happier employees I mean tons yeah. So let me ask you this question. Do you remember the first robotic project that you did and what it was? It was uh, robotic. The first robotic project I did. Yeah, it was actually for a customer here in Connecticut. Uh, they had a part where a chip would get stuck in the inside of a part. And they had these two ladies who would sit there for eight hours a day with little uh, hooks like you see at the dentist's office and pick these chips out. And that's all they did. Two ladies. All day, every all day. day. Every day. They had these big running parts. Just dental cleaning parts. That's it. And the problem was if they had sent these to their end customer and they found a part in this bag of, let's call it a thousand parts, that one, if they just came across one, the entire lot would come back. Not the one part that had the chip in it because they weren't going to sit there and look through all <laughs> right. of them. They said, well, you sent this one with it. Figure it out. So we put together a system for them that they would just- so Hold on, before we go to that. What's, yeah. So what's the impact? So I'm sending out a thousand parts and a lot. Someone finds one chip and one and get the whole thousand. Yeah. You got to sit there and go through them all. That's right. After they've already theoretically yeah. been inspected one time, right. you missed one. Now you got to do it all over again. Yeah. So you're yeah. doubling up your work. Meanwhile, customers dissatisfied because you got shipment, you got delivery Now delays. they're short a thousand parts. Right. Plus you got to pay to probably ship it back because they're not going to pay for that exactly. shipment. And then they're not going to pay you to ship it back to back. So so now you're, you know, yeah. tripling up your shipping costs, delays, then you you know, your, your quote to cash cycle gets delayed. Obviously, it's going to be frustrating for the staff because now they've got to reinspect parts they've already inspected. Mm -hmm. Whoever theoretically missed that piece, everyone else is like, what the heck? Right. Right. So, and then you and fix that, that by doing what? And that's just superhuman error. I mean, that's yeah, simple, listen, simple human error. Totally. That's Instead of when I picked this part up, I thought I cleaned it and I didn't. Or I, I started talking to the person I'm working with and I'm just, you know, it's mindless at that point when you're going to eight hours picking through parts. You're not going to be as good at hour one as you are at hour seven. Right. That's, that's just human nature. You, you can't fix that. Right. Um, but yeah, the, so the system, they just dump parts in. A robot picked them up, put them in front of a mirror nozzle, put them in a little uh, spindle that had a brush on it, and then put them in the bag. And they, it was the bag they were shipping them in. So they didn't have to rebag them. 
They just put a zippy on it and put it in the box. the door. And that system, throughput wise, was able to do what those two women did in in 40, 80 hours of work in two in sixteen hours. To the point where we programmed three other parts that they could run in that system, so they could do those as well, just for a hundred percent inspection. That was the first project you remember doing. First project that I did. Look at that. And what's uh, what's one of the most recent projects that you did? Um. So the most recent, well, there's one that's in the shop right now. That's just a, another real simple one. And that's where, I'll get back to what it is, but mm -hmm. that's where I we have found the customers are getting their best bang for their buck is not trying to do a full assembly line. Find a process that takes your people an absorbent amount of time to do a very simple task, a very repeatable task. That's where you're going to crush your ROI. I mean, that, that customer who we just talked about with the little chip, that was a six-month ROI you're not going to find that in most places. And that, that I think we he was into that system for like $80,000. He made it back in six months in labor and overhead and, and not having to ship the parts back and, and forth and no and scrap. And, and, but, so that's that. But the system that we're working on now is again, another little one. They have these little magnets that they just need to put in blister packs. And right now they're tiny magnets. They pick them up with tweezers and they put them in these blister packs. Person. Blister pack? Um, kind of like you get pills. So the pills are on like a foil back and then the plastic yeah. over it. Oh, sure, sure, it, sure, sure. And just blister pack. Okay. Um, so yeah, they just take these and they put them in Because you got to pop it out. That's why they can. Uh, whatever. Where the name came from, I have actually zero idea. Right, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> I don't know if I came up day. with it, but I didn't. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they just sit there with tweezers and, and they put these in the thing. Really? Yeah. How okay. else are you going to get them in the pack? I don't know. I guess I just assumed <laughs> it was automated. So I guess yeah, I'm about to it, find it, out that, that, now, that it is. now it is. So they, these people now, they just dump them out. There's a little table that sorts them out. We have a camera mounted up above. The robot sees a part, picks it up, puts it in the blister pack. When the pack's full, it shuttles itself out of the way and it exits the system and then it just fills another one. Easy system. Sub $100,000. So it's clear to me that anything that's low mix, high volume mm -hmm. lends itself absolutely to kind of robotic and automation. Is there application yet for high mix, low volume yes. applications? Really? Yes. Wow, I literally thought I was might stump you there, CJ. No. What do you got? So I got a so I've got a I got a high mix, low volume manufacturing yeah. environment. How are you gonna help me? So you're milling parts, but you might have you're doing lots of 10. There is a, a system that we've put on plenty of robots. It's just a quick change tooling. So it's very similar to what your bike tire is, how your bike tire, you pop the lever, it drops off. Same thing. We have a tool and there's a you know, a sister on top that has all your air and electrical plumbed into it. You pop the Brake le the bike lever, it drops out. You grab the one for the part you're running. You clip it up, you clip it in, and then you tell the robot, I'm running this part. It's going to make sure you have the right tooling on it so it doesn't smash itself into something. <laughs> and you're off. It's already programmed. I mean, yes, there is an upfront initial program to tell it instead of picking a round part, I'm now picking a square part. I can teach you how to do that. In I can teach you how to do it. And not to say that like you are you just never have run a robot. Okay. I can teach an operator how to program a new part in that system that I'm speaking about in an hour. The software is... So it might take me like two or three hours. Yeah, to or, you know, we can take it. It's up to you. <laughs> um, but, but the software, it, it's already been proven. It's a software that uh, that particular one ABB puts out. Yeah. And it's it's been run through the ringer. They are always updating it. It's very simple to say, like, you hit the button. It says, all right, take a picture of the part. Okay, where do I want to grip it? I want to grip it in these three spots, so I touch it. And you tell it what the, your gripper looks like in a couple basic parameters, and you're off. It already knows where the spindle is, or in a mill, it knows where the table is and the vice is. It's just telling you how to pick up the part now you want to run. So when, did, so uh, you know, when, how long ago did you enter this field? What year? Uh, like my first job out of college? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 2010. 2010. So, so you've been doing this for about a decade. Yeah. What, I mean, you know, what have you seen in, in terms of the changes of what we're able to do and what's been adopted over the last decade? What's different in 2020 than 2010? It's v significantly easier to get things to talk to each other. It used to be a lot of wiring and a lot of back-end programming. Suppliers are now all... Every vendor used to have their own proprietary mm -hmm. language. Yeah. Everybody. Now everybody, for the most part, except for a couple, are adopting what's called OPC UA. Mm -hmm. It's getting big. So all you can I can buy a sensor from company A, I can buy a PLC from company B, and let's say a motor from company C. 
I just tell them they're all talking in the same language and it's very easy. That was not the case when I started out. You had to buy everything from a single vendor because that was the easiest way to get a talk. You could buy them other ways, but it would take you forever to develop. Now it's, it's significantly more streamlined to be able to just plug things together, tell them what language they're speaking, and you're off. Is it also finding, so, you know, I'm going to relate this back to what I know a little bit better, which is kind of an IT, and for many people now don't even probably remember this, but, you know, in the late 80s and the early 90s, like, this was before Ethernet, TCP IP networking, which everyone knows, but that is now, or, or under, if they don't know it, everything that they have runs on it. You know, back in the old days, there was like different network cables, there was different types of network communication, you know, we'd like token ring, it was just, in, in, mm -hmm. and so he had a similar thing, and once everything started to get kind of standardized and more streamlined where you didn't have to less and less worry about could this piece work with this system two things happened became much easier to design systems because you could be more creative instead of instead of worrying that anything would work so your universe of concepts was so much smaller because it, I don't even know what else was out there, but I knew these 15 things worked together. So the only thing I wanted to design was for these 15, because mm -hmm. anytime I tried to bring in that 16th thing, yeah. then it didn't work. It just ruined my whole system. Mm -hmm. Once there's more, it, once it, it, everything was more interconnected, it started to open up creativity. And that was a huge thing. And then the second piece is it drove cost down so that if anyone remembers what it cost to buy a printer or a hard drive or heck, even a computer, is that, that's 30 years ago now? Holy moly. 30 years ago, um, compared to what it is now, it's unbelievable. And, and dollar for dollar from a, a, a power standpoint, it's mm -hmm. not even, you know, your iPhone is better than oh, net, yeah. entire networks I used to put it together. The cost is of automation the, are you seeing is the same thing? Down. The, the cost of entry into automation is the lowest I've ever seen it. It's and going lower, you think? I, I, it's going to have to because everybody's getting into it. it, it it's one of those, you know, the more traffic you're driving, they're trying to compete. Well, what's the easiest way to compete for market share? Make it cheap. Make it, yeah, try first. And the upside to, you know, we we're talking about the same language thing. Now that everybody's speaking the same language, there it's it's driving innovation in the end device. Mm -hmm. Because now I can get a sensor from any one of these vendors because it'll talk. So I need now they have to make the best sensor. Mm -hmm. And they have to make it cheap. Mm -hmm. So it, it's driving the technology and the innovation in the hardware market or in the, the peripheral market because now everything can talk to each other. So I can get that sensor from whomever because I know it'll talk to them, the PLC I'm using. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's awesome. It's the things I've seen, even in my short 10 years here in automation, it's night and day. It, they used to look so basic. They used to look, the screens would look, <laughs> it was terrible. Now I can play movies. I can make things flashy. And you know what? People love flashy. They do. People will buy something that's flashy and it might not work great versus the one that works awesome, <laughs> but looks like your father built it. You know, yeah. like it, it's wild. It's yeah. wild. The well, engagement, you know, getting people to engage with something is right. really real and adopting it. So where do you see, where do you see automation going in the next 10 years? If you don't get on it, you're not going to be around. Yeah. You're going to have in some capacity. I'm not saying your facility is going to be run by robots. It's not going to be like, uh, what's that iRobot there, where, you know, the, of the sad part is the robots we do use are made by robots. So if you look at the Fanuc facility, it's literally robots making robots. It's scary. But <laughs> Skynet. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's right there. But it, it's, it's going to help you get your workforce to be able to focus their time on the really important things they need to be worrying about, not loading a machine to make a part. It, it's, it's, uh, we, our marketing person just posted a, a study that was done. I don't remember. No, forgive me if I screw the numbers up slightly. Sure. But I want to say the study was done from like 1990 to 2000. And they found that companies that invested in automation in that time period, from the time period from 2000 to 2016, saw a 50% increase in the number of jobs they had in the facility. Companies that did not actually saw a 20% reduction. Sure. You know, listen, I, I completely agree with that. And I think, you know, sometimes people make 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 two mistakes. One is they don't think it's here yet when it's already passed them by. And the second one is, well, here it's getting cheaper. So if I just wait a little while, I'll be able to get more for less. 
and the and the challenges that didn't work in IT, right? I mean, you could have been arguing, hey, if I keep on waiting, the computers are going to keep getting cheaper. By then, your competition's way run past you, right. uh, and they're running circles around you because you're not taking advantage of the efficiency mm-hmm. uh, when you had it. And I, and I just think that's such an important that's such an important piece. Right. So I, I want to get into a couple other kind of related items. So we talked a little bit about where to get started, but do they? call you, you know, do they do it themselves? Like if I, if I'm just, if I'm like, Hey, well, I think I got this idea that this could work. What do I do with that information? You know, uh, this is an area that is repetitive task. And, you know, I I do think someone could do it, or I'm not sure where the repetitive tasks are. Mm -hmm. Do I, do I call like a concept? Do I do a, like a value map stream map? Like, what do I do? How do I start? So even I'd love for you to call me, but there are, it's called a, a automation integrator. And they call it integrator because we take all these parts, we integrate them together, and we make them do something. Um, you could reach out to any of them. Now, in, if you were to call me, you said, hey, I know I need to automate. I don't know where. I have this place. I, I don't even know, but I know I need to start getting into it. I will come to your place of your office, and we'll just walk around your plant. Show me where the people spend most of their time while they're working, and we'll just watch. We'll stand there and look. And I've been around enough places. I know what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. I can be like, hey, see that guy who's just standing over that bucket waiting for 10 minutes while the part's running? What if you could have him stand over five buckets while something's doing over there? (laughs) Right. Oh, that's a pretty good idea. I thought so too. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and that's free. I don't charge for walking around your place trying to identify a potential project. Right. Or maybe you do. Maybe you come to me like, I have this idea. I want to be laser cutting this with a robot and deburring and, you know. And I'm like, all right, we can do that. 100% we can do it. It's going to cost you a million dollars. Let's take the most labor intensive or the most hazardous to your workforce. Let's look at the subset of that and let's start there. You can always add on. Right. It's tough to take it off. Yeah, tough. <laughs> Plus, you know, listen, I'm, I'm a big believer in this. You know, if you start small yeah. and you add value – that's just going to give you more to reinvest to get more value. Right. You know, if you do this big project that's not going to come online for three years, you're just sinking dollar after dollar waiting for this big return instead of small changes get implemented, people get used to it, you're starting to see ROI, more investments, you get buy-in, like that whole yeah. deal. That's the, the biggest thing is that, you know, I'll go into these places and they don't have any automation. And this, this automation bubble is scary. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, what about, you know, X, Y, Z? And I'm like, oh, how scary was it when you first tried to operate your equipment, your CNC equipment? It was scary, huh? Like you saw this big thing. You didn't know what to do. What if it breaks? Who am I going to call? Why is a robot and, or an automation system any different? You're going to get comfortable with it. It's just a different piece of equipment. It's not, it's not anything to be scared about. It's not anything to, to be nervous about. If it breaks, yeah, it's, they're service people. Same way your mill breaks, they're service people. Well, we service in, in, in-house. in I can teach your maintenance people how to service this. It comes with a service manual. <laughs> I, I'm going to provide you the paperwork on how to fix it. It's going to come with a full list of materials where if that part breaks, here's the part number. I'll even give you the vendor to buy it from because it saves me the paperwork for, the, for buying it. Right. Like, I have... It, or we offer a great system, well, most automation people do now, where I can remote into, just like you guys can remote into my or whoever's computer and help diagnose their problem. You can see their screen. I can rem- You give me an Ethernet connection, I can remote into that automation cell, look at the program, look at the screens, and we'll usually put cameras in there so I can see what's in there. And within minutes, I can be like, hey, just go change that sensor. Just hold on. I mean, I think... That's just the coolest thing. And I think people got to really understand that, right? It's like the way people can remote support your PC, which I remember when I started it's this scary. company, that seemed like <laughs> magic. You know, I can't remember literally, I'd be on the phone with people back in like 2002, 2003. Starts, They'd be like, come over here. You got to see this. You know what I mean? Look, I'm not even touching it, you know, right. uh, which is, just seems so passe yeah. now. But that's just so cool that right. to, the concept of not only, not only if I do need service and help, not only am I automating my line, but I'm putting a position where I can get remote support yeah. on my equipment. I don't got to schedule, wait for a guy to drive out. I don't got to yell, why, is he, why isn't he here yet? You know, think about how much more and faster service I can get. That that's, that's I can have you up and running tremendous. in minutes versus maybe I can't get there today. You might be down all day until tomorrow I can get there. If you say, hey, CJ, like, I'm down. I, I can't figure it out. I within however many minutes it takes me to pop up my computer real quick. That's right. I can troubleshoot as much as I can. And usually I can get you back up and running in a couple minutes or identify the problem at least. Maybe sure. not fix it, but I can identify where you need to fix it. Right. And we and we charge less for it. We charge less for remote <laughs> service. Yeah. 
Like, yeah, no, it's so a win, win, win. Yeah. So let, let's take a turn a little bit to work for CJ. So I think, you know, you, you've touched on it a little bit, but I just want to kind of hit, maybe hit it head on. You know, I, I think one of the, there's a number of challenges I think that people are, are afraid, afraid of. And the first thing is, what is my, what's my employees going to think when they see this coming in? So, you know, if you're talking to an owner, I'm, let's say I'm owner of a manufacturer and listen, my people are, are everything. You know, I care about them. I want to make sure that they have a good future. They are blood, sweat, and tears is what's helped build this business and what's going to take it into the future. Because, you know, as far as I know, we, it isn't going to be Skynet. I'm not going to be able to just have a factory that no one's in. And I want to keep them here and give them a good future. How do I bring them on board with automation? How should I be thinking about what their future looks like with automation in the shop? So the, the first thing is, let's show them how it's going to benefit them by not having to every couple minutes go into this machine where they can focus on something maybe they're more passionate about or that's something that's more important. Show them how what they're going to be doing is more important than what they were doing. Loading a machine, yes, it's going to make the part that we're going to sell and we're going to make some money on it. But being able to maybe inspect that part that just came off and make offsets to the next part so you don't have to fix it three or four parts on the run, we're going to make more money. You're going to get a better bonus. And you could show, you know, you could show them that way. Or the way I always approach it is with the same with the same concept we've had this entire conversation. Automation is here. It's not going anywhere. So let's get it in here. Let's get you familiar with it. Now you have something on your resume that, God forbid, you needed to move on to a new position. Be like, hey, I worked with this. Mm -hmm. I, I know how to work side by side with a robot. You might not know how to program it. You might not know how to maintain it. But you've worked with them. You know how they operate. It's not foreign to you. Right. So just by putting it in there and making them comfortable with it. And we do training. It, when we put in a system, as many people as you want to have stand next to us, if you want to fill up a conference room and we'll teach you how to use that thing that comes in, I have no problem with it. I will educate your entire workforce on how to use this. So they've got to, makes the business better. Right. Makes their day-to-day -day better. Gives them a transferable skill. Yeah. I mean, this is a Show real- Show them the value. Show them why you're bringing it in. Don't show bring it in and be like, well, this is making us way faster, you know. We don't really need you over here anymore. <laughs> Show them why we're bringing it in. It's going to make parts faster, yes. But we're going to be able to take your valuable skill of knowing how to edit the program because of the results you're seeing coming off the machine, and now we've made a better product. Well, by making a better product, people in the industry are going to be like, well, if you want that part made at a good quality, go talk to those guys. Right. It, it, you, you just you got to get around the fact that we're trying to replace you because we're not. Right. We're not trying to replace you. It's all about workers. upskill. We're, we're trying to augment or, or help your workforce not do the stuff they hate to do anyways. <laughs> right. You know, you end up, I end up, uh, I like to say it all the time, I end up more of a therapist on like, a, <laughs> uh, on, on first or second sales calls as a, th you know, I'm, I'm trying to talk to the owner about like, this is why you should do it. Then I'm talking to the guy on the floor like, hey, don't be scared of this. I promise you, it's going to make your life a lot better. Yeah. It, it, and so let's look at that owner's perspective, right? Because you touched on this a little bit earlier too, and I want to hit it head on, which is, you know, the fear of, well, yeah, it all sounds great, but now I've got this really high tech machine. No one knows how to manage or maintain it. Like, and it's all this freaking programming that no one knows how to do. Mm -hmm. Like, am I going to have to hire a whole bunch of new people just to keep this thing up and running? No. Yeah. I usually say, find one guy that you, or, you know, board it or how your facility is different. Find a guy that you want to make your automation guy. Vanek runs schools, ABB runs schools, just like they, a lot of people are sending their CNC maintainer mm -hmm. operated programmers to programming school. Got to do it. The robot people do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And they're cheap. They're not expensive. I think like a week at Vanek school was like two grand. Like, yeah, you pay lodging the flight and go to Michigan, wherever they are. But that knowledge they're going to gain, now you don't need to call me. Mm -hmm. If you want to make it have, make it run a new part, he knows how to just get behind the controller, program it up real quick or make a touch up and you don't need it. And that investment in that new maintenance or automation guy, you're growing your, you're growing the knowledge of your workforce. You didn't have to, you didn't replace them. You actually probably brought somebody else in new. You're growing. You're, it's, it's, automation is very few and far between now that there are people who just say like, you know, I don't want anybody here. I'm just going to run it by robots. You could. I don't think it's going to make you the best product. I really don't. I think you need people there who know what you're making to make a good part. A robot's just going to help you get to the finish line. Mm -hmm. It's not going to take you from start to finish. Hey, listen, I totally agree with that. Let's, uh, while we're on the workforce topic, 
do you believe that, and I get, or maybe I'm putting words in your mouth here, but because you really did say automation's here and the people that don't grab automation will know who they are because they'll be the has-beens or gones by 2030 and, mm-hmm. and certainly beyond that. So when we're thinking about developing the workforce of the future in Connecticut, and I've said many times that I believe that as manufacturing goes more to brains than it did from brawn, Connecticut has some real advantages because of how highly educated we are and the different schools we have, but we have to press that advantage. We can't sit on our laurels because the industry is changing and we got to be ahead, not mm-hmm. behind. Um, I guess first I would say, do you, do you agree with that? Um, and, and what, for the people that are listening who are involved in workforce development, what do they need to know from where you're sitting? What do we have to do to get the people that are either getting upskilled, reskilled, or trained from the beginning that are going to, you know, ask Nuntuck or going to Three Rivers that are getting, you know, trained up Goodwin College, wherever it is. What do we need to be teaching these people so that they can be productive contributors to the manufacturing workforce in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Yeah. So find someone who already kind of has like, maybe I think I'm passionate about it. Don't just pick the guy who's like, oh, this comes with a raise. Like, hey, I'm in. <laughs> because once you get into it, if you get stuck and you're not real passionate about it, you're just going to throw the controller away. You find some, uh, you, I found most times it's the younger guys. The younger kids in the shops, if you say, hey, I need somebody who wants to learn how to run that thing. They're the first <laughs> oh, people man. to put their hand up. Yeah. Either the older guys like, you know, I only got like 10 years till I'm retiring. I'm good. The young kids are like, hey, they, I, I, the younger people I have found acknowledge the fact that it's coming. Mm-hmm. It's the older folks that are still hard pressed to accept it. But you, know, you get the, and there's, there are colleges around here that offer robotics and mechatronics programs. One of uh, our guys in, in my shop, he just graduated from, well, not just, maybe like two years ago from, what is it? Central Connecticut, I think, has a mechatronics program. And yes, Nuntuck has a big mechatronics. Yeah, yep. and they, he has all the Phoenix certificates. So it's, he didn't even have to go to the school. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I did a couple spotlight uh, classes at uh, vocational school right there. Um, why can't I think of it? One of those vocational schools happens, in Connecticut. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I taught them PLCs. And I got demo units from vendors of mine, and I gave them to them. Now, if they're still using it or not, I don't know. I haven't been back there since all this craziness went on. But just trying to get hands-on, just knowledge of it. Maybe you don't know how to use it, but you know it exists. Mm-hmm. And if you had to learn it, you could. But so if I said, hey, Ari, can you go grab that PLC for me? You wouldn't say, well, what's a PLC? <laughs> right. right. At least be able to pick it off the shelf. Let's sure, sure. Off that, the shelf. That's a great place let's, to start. Let's start right? picking off the shelf. Don't go in the stock room <laughs> and just look around and be like, please be labeled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> please have a big sign that says PLC. No, I mean, just getting exposure to it because there is – mainstream, there isn't a lot of frontal exposure to automation. Yeah. All you see on is frontal exposure is these big assembly lines mm-hmm. or the final product. You don't see what went into it. Like I spoke to those kids and they had their their web development kids and or individuals. They weren't kids. They were in high school. Um, but and so the, the screens now that are on all the operators run on HTML5. Mm-hmm. Very so, familiar. Yeah. So I don't I don't need a person who knows how to program a PLC screen. I can find a, key, uh, a person who knows how to program web, mm-hmm. which makes the screens way better, way, way better. more intuitive, totally. much better. And I can be like, hey, I know you have no idea what this, like how to do the back end stuff. Give me something that is going to wow the pants off this customer. And they can. Yeah, and yeah. Because again, all that same language stuff. Now I can take a person who knows how to program a web page in HTML5. I have a person who knows how to program a PLC. I have a person who knows how to d- program a robot. And they're all working on the same project. And at the end of the day, they all stand around and go, huh, so that's what I did. That's what I did. And look, it it works. And works. when you're able to get all those kids behind one project like that, it's awesome. Yeah. No, yeah. dude, it's it's so cool. And uh it's such a fun part. It's just it's so fun for, for me to be a part of it, you know, in some small way to see the intersection between IT, IoT, automation, PLC, and manufacturing to feel like and see all that stuff come together because the one of the best parts about manufacturing f- from my perspective is just seeing something become something else and to be part of whatever it is, whether it's a part of a jet engine, a staple that goes in somebody, a, a safety net, a, you know, a piece of a car, like a piece of a helicopter, a missile, a radar system, like just seeing these things come off the line and knowing they go out in the world uh, and, and improve someone's life or help someone to have fun or yeah. go on vacation or whatever. It's uh, 
It's really, it's a, it's a, it's a very cool thing. That's the other thing with automation. It's like, you can get your hands in anything. Yeah. Like I happen to be in manufacturing. I used to be in food products. Like I made frozen pizzas. That was pretty cool. (laughs) Sure. You know, or there's so many different ways to take automation. You're, you can find a niche group if you're really passionate about automating software, where there's automation in your software. You can take your two passions and put them together. You like to eat and you like to automate, go make a frozen pizza. Like you can get any, you can, you can get your hands in a ton of stuff or you can like it, my previous customer or previous employer, I was all over the place. I did stuff for furniture manufacturers to hydraulic pump makers to, I mean, you name it. I was all over the place, which was cool because every day I went in and I was working on something different. Now I'm slightly more tapered, but with like a V at the end because I get into <laughs> manufacturing, but then I get into like inspection or I get into packaging or I get into different things. So I'm in manufacturing, but I'm still kind of a little place. bit everywhere. It's just nice. It, it, it keeps you interested. So you uh, before back. we just kind of get to rapid fire yeah. rounds, we kind of wrap it up. Like for someone that's out there who's like, man, CJ is super passionate. Sounds like it's a fun gig. Like what is it? I guess two kind of questions linked to each other. You know, what is it like to do your job day to day for someone that's like, maybe I'd like to do that. What, what is that like? And after you kind of describe that, what's your favorite part of what you get to do? All right. So day to day, there's a lot of sitting behind a computer in the beginning and you, know, you got to design it. We, that's right. you know, our entire system from start to finish is laid out in 3d. So every, every screw, every, I mean, every screw is modeled in this thing so that when we go to order it, I can say, I need 20 of these type screws sure. so that when we go to build it, I don't say, oh shoot, now I have to go to the hardware store. <laughs> like we have everything in house. So it, it's a very intense model. So, you know, we have people who sit on a computer and model all day, which is awesome. I, that I used to work for a company where I did everything. I did quoting. I did the modeling. I did the panel building. I did the programming. I did the delivery. I did the install. I was one of three people in this entire business. The owner, the guy who answered the phone. <laughs> you. <laughs> and it was awesome because yeah. I got my hands in all that stuff, sure, sure. which is still where I love to do it. So I pop in and out where I can because it's fun. But so day to day, you're the designing or we're programming or we're building. Those are the big, those are the three big main stages of an automation project. The first two, designing and programming behind a computer. Building. I'm out on the floor. I'm turning a wrench. I'm, you know, doing whatever, whatever it is, which is great. And that leads me right into my favorite part is that I can start with a white screen on my computer. And in a short period of time, I can be standing on the floor watching this robot do whatever the heck we designed it to do. And the customer stands there and goes, that's pretty sweet. (laughs) I do. I connect with that, that so much. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That, I love it when I can a customer. And you can see on their face; they don't have to say anything. They can just stand there and be like, "Wow, yeah, that that was pretty cool. It did exactly what you told me it would." <laughs> I'm like, I know. That's why I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it would do it. Oh, that's. But uh, yeah, that's the best part is the delivery. The when I'm doing a runoff for a customer, and they get exactly what they signed up for plus some. And they're happy with it because a lot of the customers we work with in manufacturing don't know the extent that robotics can get to. So when I tell them like, Hey, I can do that. I'm like, yeah, it's not that hard. They're like, it's not that hard. I'm like, promise you really not that bad. Like you think it's hard. It's really not. Somebody's done it. We could do it. And then they come in and they see it done. And they're like, oh, Shit, I you guess you knew what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, right. Last question. Yes, I'm going to go to these rapid fire round, but what cool stuff, that would, I don't know if I'm, I would almost say challenge you to blow my mind, but that might be difficult. But what, what kind of crazy stuff do you think will be out there that we haven't really seen before, or that's not out there widely right now in five, 10, 15 years, you know, what's going to change from the capabilities of robotics and automation that we haven't seen? Where is it going? Do you have any sense of what so might the, blow the our mind? The biggest thing right now, and it's in most fields, is the, the AI stuff, the, the learning as you go or being able to just learn as you take us a picture. So, you know, we're talking about uh, high mix, low volume, being able to just put a part under a camera, have it take a picture, identify what it is. And then let's say at the end of the VARM tool, it's able to make an adjustment to know how to pick that part up. Then there's no programming. Then your high mix, your, 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 your high mix, low volume became a non-issue. Non-issue. Because, you know, you have a gripper that maybe can go from a triangle to a square or 
pick whatever. up different. Yeah, it, it can take. It can identify the shape. It knows the best way to pick that shape up. It can grab it and put it in your vice. That's where I think it's going to go. Then again, when I started ten years ago, I couldn't have imagined where it is now. <laughs> that you know that that robots are so readily available, so cheap. And I say, I mean, they're still expensive. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm not about to no, go but, spend you know, my money on it. No, I, yeah, no, I get that though. But I think it's so important because I know companies that are small, right. 18, 20 people companies that are running robots yeah. and companies that are like five times, 10 times that size that are like, ah, it's not ready yet. No, it's ready. Get it. Yeah. yeah. That first no. system that we did, they, it's just a small robot. They're a big shop. Yeah. They put this little, this little robot. It's not a big one. It's a little, little payload because they're just picking up these tiny parts. And it's paid off huge for them. Yeah. No, it's terrific, man. That's awesome, CJ. It's yeah. been great uh, having awesome. you on. I Let's hit this it. rapid fire round of questions. You yes, ready, sir. boss? Sure. All right, here we go. Red Sox or Yankees? Red Sox. Nice. Starbucks or Dunkin'? Dunkin'. When you take time off and the COVID out the window here, yeah. when you take time off, you a staycation or exotic destination kind of guy? I am a staycation guy. What was your uh, last staycation? Uh, Lake Winnipesaukee. Oh. My grandparents have a house up there. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I'm a lake guy. iPhone or Android? Android. Uh, sports car or SUV? We'll go SUV. All right. I'm not, a big sport. I'm not a car guy. If you could do anything yeah. other than what you're doing right now for RA and you had to do something else and it could be anything in the whole wide world. Heck, it could be anything in the universe, man. Yeah. What would you do? Is money an issue? No, okay. whatever you want. I would love to own a nonprofit hockey equipment store. I grew up playing hockey. I have my best friends. I all grew up playing hockey. It, the the bonds I've made with people in hockey are awesome. But the problem with hockey is it's not cheap. No. Like, like a stick is like 300 bucks. So I would love to own a place where I could sell things at cost, just enough to like cover the overhead and just open up that that support to kids. I would love it. Very cool. Yeah. Man. Do you have a, a favorite business book? I don't. Do you have a favorite book at all? I have a couple. Give me one. Uh, 11 Seconds by... Uh, why can't I think of this for Travis Roy? Oh, he is a, he I know passed, Travis. He, he just passed away two, yesterday, two days ago. Did he? Oh, sorry. No, it's all right. Oh, yeah. I didn't know. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. people that don't know Travis uh, played for BU mm -hmm. and uh, for 11 seconds to a first shift in his first game, he was paralyzed mm -hmm. from the uh, neck down. And yeah. uh, I, I knew Travis a little bit because. Yeah. Um, his one of the guys on his hockey team at Tabor Academy in uh, Cape Cod was my freshman year roommate at Tufts, oh, wow. and uh, so that kind of all happened yeah. before that. Yeah. So I had reached out to Travis just after my accident. You know, just reached out to right. you know give him a give him a thumbs up yeah. and support. And he was a real inspirational guy. That I, book I, was awesome. I that, eleven I, seconds. I've read that a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, that's great, man. I I got to go read. I can't believe I haven't read that book. Yeah. I've seen his, I've seen the movie on TV and stuff. Right. He's uh, yeah, it's great. I bet you that's a very cool story. Yeah. So uh, listen, man, uh, CJ, what's one thing that you learned early in your career or early in your life that you think has helped propel you to the success that you've had? Be okay failing. A lot of things I've tried, they don't work. But the ones that have worked, work great. <laughs> and and they've, they've, get, they've propelled me in my career. Be okay failing. Failing just means you tried. You know, I, I, my guys at work, I said, I, they'd be like, hey, what do you think about this? I'm like, you do whatever you think is right. Make a decision. I don't care if it works or not. Figure out if it did work, great. If it didn't, tell me why it didn't work. Don't make it this makes, Don't make the same mistake twice. Learn from your mistake. Be okay failing. That's There's a lot are. of kids these days that are not okay failing. <laughs> and, and, and it's going to be hard to get anywhere right. good. You got to be okay to fail. That's how you learn. Yeah, that's how we learn, how that's we grow. It. What's one thing that you've learned later in your career or later in your life that if you went back to tell young CJ and he listened to you, it'd really uh, bump him up? Slow down. I was running real quick thinking I was going to become like some big wig at some place in five years after I got out of college. Just slow down. Enjoy it. Take the lessons you're learning and actually implement them. Don't figure it out two years later that you should have done something else. So just, just you know, soak it up. Enjoy it. Slow down. Just, slow down. Just slow down. Now nope. I got two kids. There's no slowing down. <laughs> Don't be in a rush. Yeah. Life, <laughs> life comes up on you real, real just, fast. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of things you can, you can, uh, you know, you can change. Time is not one thing you can change. Dude, no doubt about it, man. Yeah. That reminds me of that uh, Ferris Bueller line. You know, it's uh, life moves pretty fast. And if you don't stop and look around every once in a while, it'll just pass it's you pass right you by. by yeah. Hey, man, CJ, it has been an absolute pleasure yeah. uh, having you on here and your views. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by IT Direct.
As always, thank you so much for tuning in and spending some time with me today. You know, my goal is to help build a community where we can learn and grow together. Your input, feedback, and engagement is critical to making that happen. Please do comment, like, and subscribe so more and more people can hear what we're doing and join our community of growth and success. Thanks so much for tuning in. Talk to you again soon.